uh, we are really uh, glad to have you as our speaker uh, for this. And um, thank you, Sundara. Yeah, over to you. Please uh, take it away. And we are very, very eager to understand your work and what you're going to talk about today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, we'll try to uh, keep it an uh, interactive session. I understand that you guys cannot uh, speak, so maybe you can write your chats in between. But if you think that there is a point which you do not understand, let me know then there before you forget about it. And uh, apart from keeping it interactive, we'll keep it at a high level where we will try and understand that what could be very relevant for you as of now. So I assume most of you are about to pass your current batch or if so you are about to be data scientist soon. Uh, you can reply a yes, no in the chat. Yeah. Great. Okay. So I started my journey with Insofe uh, some five years ago in 2015. Um, I'm working as a data scientist. Uh, today we'll be discussing the challenges one faces when trying to deploy a machine learning model. So throughout the course, you learned about uh, what machine learning is and how can you build models which are artificially intelligent and helps us take decisions or help, will help the business in decision-making process. But the challenge is that that is not enough. So when you're hired by a company, the expectation is that uh, you convert this knowledge into revenue for them. And that is something which you can do only after, not, so your work start goes beyond the modeling. So even if you have a very good model, which can predict something or which can get insights from the data and read the patterns, which are usually not visible in the data, but how would you use that? So you have to deploy it in production and there are some challenges which we come across while trying to do so. So today's discussion will be around those challenges. I'll share my screen so that uh, uh, I have a small presentation and we'll take it from there. If you guys have any questions till now, you can ask me and let me just open the screen. Okay, so is my screen visible? Uh, yes, Avinash. Yes. Okay, great. Let me just put it on full screen. So, uh, as I was talking about myself, so I started my journey with Insofi in 2015. I was a software developer before I joined Insofi's program. And currently I'm working as a senior manager at Capture and I, uh, which Sindhura mentioned. But yeah, uh, in these five years, there had been many changes and I was hired as a data scientist and I worked with a comp in a company for another three years, then another, another company for another two years. And I joined Capgemini some six months ago. Uh, during this five years period, I've worked on a variety of projects involving let's say uh, fraud analytics or boot optimization or natural language processing. So a variety of projects, uh, I mean, for a number of domains starting from retail to pharma to banking. So and many domains and uh, my work was distributed across geographies also. So um, had to deal with clients from UK, Europe, US, various places. And this is what you should envisage each one of you would be doing when you are in the market. So you'll be dealing with a variety of clients in a variety of industries. And this is because data science itself is domain agnostic. So once you understand the, understand the algorithms well, and if you can map it to the business requirement, how you have to apply it to solve the problem, then it doesn't matter which domain are you applying this algorithm. So, and I hope you guys are doing very well at Ensofe and you're understanding the basics of uh, machine learning and other algorithms. 
right the topic of today is once you have learned these algorithms you can build a model using fast data and let's say it is a very robust model then what challenges could you face when you are trying to put this uh, model in production and we'll shortly look into it uh, my current domain is supply chain but uh, as mentioned earlier that i've worked in multiple domains so currently i'm working in supply chain at capgemini and they're um, improvising on some existing forecasting models which they have and various analytics processes uh, i am also responsible for identifying new use cases for machine learning and optimizing various processes within supply chain so it could be like let's say there is a manufacturing process and uh, th there is uh, something called uptime for a manufacturing process so how how many hours did the machine run when they were supposed to run for x number of hours so what were the reasons that the machine did not work uh, so it could uh, encompass various things like uh, for detecting or predicting the faults in the machine and then apart from that other things that there could be issues in supply chain or in the delivery because of which uh, the uptime is impacted so taking all those into account uh, let's say how can you opt optimize the uptime improve the average uptime so and then things like prediction classification clustering which you all might be aware of very well so that that's my current role uh, apart from that i also do mentoring for um, people at capgemini so those who are into data science and already working on some projects i improvise their model i also mentor them explain them how to use this and support them whenever required okay so let's talk about deployment machine learning model deployment uh, meanwhile if you have any questions if, uh, let me just check the chat window so if you have any questions feel free to ask if you want to ask something from me let's make it uh, as casual as possible before we start with the main topic if you have any questions for me feel free anyone okay anyways you can raise hands or there are various things you can do in zoom applications uh, avinash there is actually one question from one of our alumni who cannot join us today but okay. uh, he had asked a few how to productionize large models which mm -hmm. are more than 1 gb of size and how to reduce latency in these large models okay so uh, models with more than 1 gb in size so you mean the ml model code is more than 1 gb um because I, data I, 1 gb is not a very big uh, thing so 1 yeah. gb data is not even considered big data in our days because you have so much space in personal desktops and personal uh, laptops all right so i think from the code uh, angle please let us know a 1 gb of code okay yeah. Yeah. and uh, let's say reduce the latency so uh, although it depends on a lot number of things so how is the data coming in the model so let's say if the is the model used for real time predictions or is it uh, the model is built in batch and then i uh, means the predictions of the model happen let's say either on a at a certain time on daily or monthly basis or weekly basis so that is something one has to understand because latency could happen in the network itself where you are trying to pass the input to the model so let's say i have to take a decision whether to approve or disapprove a loan and i need certain features uh, let's say the customer's age the customer's salary and various things and i have built a model and deployed it on my bank's website where the customer can supply this information and in real time for let's say 80% of the cases i can go ahead and approve or disapprove the loan versus i um, mean 20% of cases that kept which are more complex maybe we take more time to get to the customer so in such a case you have to ensure that no matter how uh, big the model is but the entire pipeline should be uh, should have low latency including the bandwidth of the server the lit the various uh, let's say it infrastructure it should be in place to uh, ensure that we have minimal latency so once you ask the right question once you supply the data then you should get the output apart from the internet and web support yeah depending on what kind of complexity the model itself has whether it is a simple decision tree or whether it's a 
complex deep learning model uh, how many steps it has to take to give the predictions you may require some faster cpus or gpus to get the prediction quickly so it depends on various use cases unless and until we know the details there is no one answer for all the cases we have to understand why the latency is coming in and then take steps take measures to uh, minimize it i i hope that is clear hello avinash yes. can you hear me yes i can i, I am yugandar actually uh, within our company we try to productionize a model uh, to predict uh, uh, target variable it is a supervised learning and we know how to deal with that problem but the problem we see is we do not have the data infrastructure required to productionize the model basically we are limited to whatever data whatever training data our desktop supports only that much we can do but uh, we have 500 gb of uh, granular data where we need to pre process it before uh, applying any machine learning algorithms so in this yeah, in this case actually our data our data is in uh, sap hana database and we do not have enterprise license for the database and uh, we had lot of discussions with sap mm -hmm. uh, how to build a, how to productionize these machine learning models but finally they told uh, uh, they have suggested a, a new tool which uh, which is a cloud cloud based sap uh, data hub mm -hmm. where we can build data lakes by uh, uh, by extracting the data available in sap hana database and there we can you know, i integrate with the python jupyter notebooks and uh, we can productionize the model by uh, building the docker containers like this so i just want to know like uh, in your current project uh, which uh, environment uh, you are productionizing the models like uh, in that way it will helpful for me now uh, that will be uh, i believe uh, so that depends on the project and the client requirement so let's say le let me just explain you what is happening here so first of all the model is not big it's a data source and where is the lag coming in so the lag is coming in because when you are calling making a call to sap and you want to uh, get the input for the model uh, say multiple number of calls they'll have to wait in the queue so before it replies to the calls so there are only fixed number of parallel calls which you can make to the sap server so uh, it is important that maybe maybe it makes complete sense to go with a distributed computing framework like you mentioned hana but then uh, sap with hana would not be open source if i'm correct so uh, that is another thing you have to uh, take care of so if uh, if the company is or the client is which it, uh, for which you are doing this if they are ready to go with a paid tool because the data itself is in sap server and if you combine it with a distributed computing which is a paid tool so that will be again a expense so if the client is ready to bear it uh, otherwise the other option would have been that if you could bring this data in a data lake and work together on a open source system uh, supported by hadoop and spark tools then it would bring down the cost but then there are other things required developing the system has a considerable effort so there are various options and uh, uh, usually a, a company or enterprise looks at the pros and cons of each of the options and the availability of technical resources with them in case a fault occurs and based on that they make their decisions that what seems to be the right thing as of now uh did i did i answer your question i do you have yeah, further questions i hope you understand that why uh, hana was required with sap why was there a lag because you cannot make parallel calls and if you cannot get the input uh, so if you are making too many calls uh, everything will wait in queue so it's not that the model is taking time in prediction but the model is taking time in getting the right input and therefore it is time taking to get the predictions overall so if the lag is there then you have to ensure that the model gets input quickly and a 
from a huge repository of data. The model can get inputs quickly only if the inputs are uh, coming from a, uh, if you can make a distributed call. So you have number of threads giving the input, but that should be supported by the framework where the input is stored. Let's say it's a database and it can support only three to four threads at parallel. So you cannot have more than those calls. So those limit, even if we have a very fast machine, even if you are using a high-end CPU or a GPU for your machine learning model, it will still take time in giving the predictions because the data itself is coming very slowly. And the way out is to store it on some, uh, some hardware which supports distributed computing, whether paid or open source. And uh, each has their own pros and cons. Chat. Okay. Yes, I'll answer that. So did I answer this question or is there any uh, further query? Uh, I think this is his, uh, uh, sufficient as of now, Avinash. We can proceed. Oh, great. Okay. So, and I have a lot of questions and I'm very happy about it. So let me just check. That's a... Okay. Give me a moment while I'm reading these chats. Approach to identify use cases in a particular domain. Okay, I'll start from this first question. So this is Rajini. So Rajini, what happens is, so you uh, do a data science program at Insofi, you understand that how these algorithms work and what can they do for you. But that's just one part of learning. The other part is how do you map the business problems and uh, with what these machine learning algorithms can do for you. So uh, let's say if you know that there is a classification algorithm and it can classify and give you a yes, no, or a Boolean reply. Now you need to understand that should I, uh, so you need to understand, okay, this is a uh, algorithm which I know, but in business setting, what uh, jobs I might be doing where I, I may utilize the classification algorithm. So maybe uh, your day on day job, let's say you are in pharma and you are visualizing some x-rays, you want to find out whether the cells are of a particular type or not. So that could be a yes, no answer where a decision making leading to a Boolean reply is occurring. Or maybe it could be very different. It could be uh, uh, maybe uh, industry, let's say you are on an e-commerce uh, giant, you are an e-commerce giant and you want to find out whether the customer will make the decision to buy a product if the product is already put in the car. So uh, that's a yes, no answer that whether he will buy after putting it in the car or whether he will not. And you want to build a model around it. That, uh, how often does it happen? What is the probability if this is the customer, this is the area, this is the product he or she will end up buying or not. So that can that business problem can be mapped to the algorithm, the classification algorithm, a family of classification algorithms, and then you may check okay which you want to use. So this mapping is required when we talk about identifying use cases. That means something which is happening in the business on a daily basis, uh, something which is complex enough so that you cannot code it using a software. So it is not like adding some numbers. It is. It has more complexities there. Uh, it is depending on the attributes where you do not have complete information of all the attributes, and you think that you can such in such a scenario. What the business is doing is it is partially using the information it has, and partially it is using their intuition to make that those results or to take decisions. So these are the uh, right places where you can map your machine learning skills. So you can understand. Okay, there is. Uh, a use case which can which can be solved using these machine learning. I hope that uh, gives you the answer. If you have uh, uh, any other question, let me know. If you have a specific doubt, please ask. Okay. Next, Narain, you say that can you please let us know what kind of models are used in supply chain domain. Okay, so uh, Narin, are you from supply chain? No, okay, uh, 
So let me check. Yes, great. So uh, the task which you do in supply chain industry. So there is a need for demand forecasting. There could be the demand of a product or maybe an accessory. There is a need for shipment forecasting, what could be load coming up. There's also a need of the entire optimization process. Uh, let's say you may have a lot of suppliers, a lot of vendors, and each of them, uh, let's say you make a forecast for the demand of a particular product. Your, your forecast is affecting uh, what you will ask from the suppliers and the suppliers in turns will ask from various vendors. So it's a long chain. And plus in supply chain, you have to make long-term forecast. So let's say you are in a current week, but you have to forecast, let's say for the next month. Why? Because uh, you can, you have the weekly sales data and you can forecast easily for the next week. But even if you have the information, you do not have enough time. So the buffer time is more because you need to uh, take a lot of stakeholders which are involved in the entire process, right? From manufacturing to vendor to supplier so that if you predict the demand at least a month or two in advance, then uh, the product could be in market when uh, there is a demand. If you are making a prediction for next week, maybe we don't have enough time. So you have to, uh, let's say at times forecast a few steps ahead. And as you might have attended your time series forecasting lectures, uh, you would have realized that the confidence of the forecast dwindles exponentially the more steps you are trying to forecast. So you have less confidence in your forecast. So your entire effort goes in making those forecasts at a certain number of steps, let's say five steps ahead, maybe five months ahead or five weeks ahead. Those forecasts, making those forecasts more uh, robust. So, so that the uh, you do not have a a uh, major impact on maybe the forecast accuracy or let's say your errors are still as low as possible. Apart from that, there are other challenges. Sometimes there is a lot of volatility when it comes to forecasting models. And forecasting and optimization are not the only thing. There are various places where you want to segregate various types of vendors. So you, you need to apply various clustering techniques. So whatever you learn in supply chain, uh, whatever you learn in data science, you can apply everything in supply chain. Uh, the only reason why uh, I am more into identifying use cases in supply chain because the applicability of machine learning in supply chain is considerably less compared to other domains. And therefore, one part of my job is finding use cases because we do not have many software products catered to specific requirements as it is available in retail or pharma or maybe banking. So uh, this uh, supply chain is slightly slower to pick up data science. And therefore I'm uh, laying a emphasis there. Thank you. Let me check if we have other questions. How complex the scenarios in supply chain for analytics management? Can you throw some like, well, uh, Nathan, it depends. So that's a subjective question. It depends on how complex a thing could be. So fraud analytics is complex, but the reason is that you have very less fraudulent data. So when it comes to banking and finance, fraud is complex because there is a huge class imbalance there. So maybe you have 0.00001% customers who are fraudulent and rest are not fraudulent. So you have very less data to learn. Maybe you go for uh, some alternative approach instead of usual classification. So uh, something like an anomaly detection or a two-step process where you detect that this could possibly be a fraud because it looks anomalous. And in the next step, you want to identify whether it's a fraud or not. So uh, it could be a, a cascade model kind of a thing. So fraud becomes tough, but simply because of the uh, imbalance, class imbalance, and you do not have enough data points to do the learning. Uh, when it comes to other algorithms, I believe algorithms itself are not touched, uh, uh, let's say tough. So if you understand the algorithms very well, if, no matter, even if it's like time series forecast, you know the algorithm very well, but at times it could become tough for you to do the forecast. Why? Because maybe it's a new product, 
or the data points are very the sale of the product is very volatile maybe it is that kind of product where the sale is volatile sometimes it goes up sometimes it comes down uh, for no reason we can figure out in such a scenario even a simple uh, time series forecasting model becomes tough so uh, the tough and the easy part uh, more depends on the data and less on the environments or the use case it depends on some data the same models could be uh, it could be easier to uh, get good results and bring revenue to the business and sometimes it becomes tough oh thanks avinash uh, we have a person here who is requesting that we can uh, proceed with uh, you know what you have prepared and then come back to questions at later yes point. that's what i'll do thank you yes. thank you okay so yes we'll come back to questions uh, later on if there is a question related to what i am covering then please ask uh, in between also otherwise so okay so there is a paper out we are trying to discuss here that what is the uh, what is what are the problems one faces when we are trying to deploy our machine learning model and there is a very famous paper i have mentioned the link in the notes this is the paper uh, let me just copy it and show it so or maybe you can uh, i'll just send this link in chat so this paper uh, with that heading hidden uh, technical data and machine learning system it talks about what are the uh, problem one faces when you are trying to deploy a machine learning model in production so most of the times the major problem is that uh, business most of the business they and take machine learning models as uh, usual softwares and they deal with it as if they are dealing with a new software application and in reality in essence it is very different from a software it is uh, the model building process is very different from software development so if we understand the differences we can also probably understand why uh, it becomes important to uh, take care of various things while doing the deploy and uh, we will will go with it one by one so when it comes to traditional softwares uh, we had years of experience decades of experience and there is a strategy on how to deploy models how to build softwares and how to design the entire products so design is usually kept modular uh, if some of you are from the software field or has uh, worked as a software developer in the past or have some exposure to it will know that how important it is or how imperative it is when you writing a code you are asked to segregate the data and the logic so you keep the program uh in a modular form and very distinct from the data so you do not want data and logic to jumble with each other and that is a, a good software engineering practice that ensures that you would not get into errors because data is an input which is coming from an external source and you do not have a control over it whereas the logic should not fail because of the data the data should pass through some checks and then uh, as per the requirement can be called by the program when it, and uh, if you look at the picture that's how it is a program is different data is different and then you build the application oh, whereas a logic is working on whenever it needs data it takes the input and produces some output for it and generates the result when it comes to machine learning this data and program there is a need to uh, put both of them together there is a requirement to uh, tie up the uh, data points with the logic Uh, or maybe the algorithm let's say you're trying to classify using logistic regression but logistic regression itself is built on if the you create you want to create a models then you'll have to apply this algorithm on the data so you have to entangle the data with the logic and that entanglement is not the right software engineering practice but it is imperative for machine learning or data science field it is utmost important that is how we will we can take decisions or form formulate models by looking at the data and also update those models because these are uh, uh, these machine learning models are which are part of the uh, ai domain 
they are supposed to take intelligent decisions they will not take the same decisions for the same data points if things change whereas in software development i know that every time uh, i'll pass the same input i'm uh, i'm supposed to get the same output which is not true for machine learning and it is not supposed to be true because we as human beings also do not uh, do not behave like that so let's say if you meet me today you may have a different view about me but let's say you meet me after a few days you may have a different view about me so because you you simply do not have a logic separate from the data taking decisions you combine your logic with the current data which you have to come up with a decision making process so for machine learning it is imperative and that causes entanglement in data then there are uh, let's say we talk about correction cascades which is about let's say one step uh, one decision making or one different kind of point affects so many points uh, i mean the uh, whether it's a error or it's is the right thing everything is cascaded in machine learning models so it's a iterative process and after let's say a few number of iterations you do not have a track of what caused something when we talk about undeclared consumers what we are saying is let's say you go ahead and develop a forecasting model uh, for a company for a specific purpose but the company might tell you that okay uh, we would uh, want to use this model for this purpose also please make some changes and give us the model so uh, because the company utilizes a data science model as if it's a software program now this uh, consumers which come up not which were not there when you were preparing the model and suddenly come up uh, and they start using the model may lead to disastrous results in data science because you haven't looked at the data uh, the assumptions of your model may not stand true for that data and it's taking decisions for that data uh, which is a common practice when we treat machine learning very similar to software development now this causes a lot of problems and break of codes in production and um, we are here to discuss what all problems can happen and how do we go about uh, what can we do can we do a few things to solve these problems i hope the point is clear uh, because some of you might not have uh, uh, run or deployed models in production but this might be required uh, maybe in the first six months of your job you'll be required to you would be required to do that and understand the challenges not as a software engineer deploying it or uh, maybe a devops developer deploying it but as a data scientist you have to be cognizant of it you have to write down your assumptions you have to uh, help them formulate a strategy to deploy this model because they would not know uh, the internal details of the machine learning model okay so there has to be Uh, a way in which uh, every company bridges that gap where a data science team and the engineering team which is deploying it uh, works in tandem but uh, works together to ensure the results are good so let's see what all do we face now uh, a usual machine learning model uh, if we prepare the model and uh, i'm pretty sure each one of us are aware of these steps so the first step being data acquisition we acquire the data could be in a database or maybe unstructured data you crawled from the web but once you acquire the data then comes the data preparation you prepare the data uh, clean the data you maybe transforms all the attributes then the next step is experimentation which is your model development so you try a few models and you experiment with a number of models and you train those models finally you you have kept some part of the data apart as a test set and you start measuring the let's say accuracy or whatever error metric you defined for that model okay how good it is and you validate it so you do the evaluation and this is a iterative approach so your training continues till you get a satisfactory accuracy but it doesn't stop there you have accuracy you can make predictions with the model but now you want to deploy it the uh, the right side of deployment part where your model will take input and make predictions it needs to be monitored because uh, the the model itself is formed on let's say past 6 months or past 2 years of data which uh, which uh, may be following a certain distribution and if the macroeconomic state changes which affects the data 
and if the distribution of data evolves, then it will start affecting the model. So there has to be a strategy to monitor or generate alerts. Let's say you develop a system which tells you if the, uh, let's say model's accuracy goes down by more than 10% or 15%, there should be an alert and there is a need to update the model or retrain the model. Then also there is a data drift. So uh, there is a possible chance that there could be basic changes in the way data used to happen and you are using it in the model. Uh, the companies, uh, the company has drifted from uh, those data points and other data points have suddenly become more relevant. So if that is the case, then you have to prepare the data again and then start the steps all over. So simple retraining will not work. And each of these things should be in a way incorporated in the deployment phase. So the deployment phase should support all these things, which is not a usual case for a software application deployment. For software application deployment, I deploy the software. And if I'm coming up with a new version, the older version is replaced. But it does not follow this complex process of retraining or maybe completely changing the data, uh, uh, regularly monitoring and alerting the system with the, if there's a deviations in whatever we think should be the right value for the metric. In software uh, programs, you always know that for the same input, unless and until there is a bug, we should always have the same output, uh, which is not the case in machine learning. So if you're cognizant of it, the right side of the uh, uh, picture shows uh, the small, very small black box in between. This is your ML code. But what you see is there are a number of other things which are surrounding your ML code in production. So there has to be the various configurations, the complete data collection and data verification process, the uh, resource management. There has to be a serving infrastructure. This will help you do the predictions or uh, help the model do the predictions. So take care of whether it is required in real time, whether it is required uh, in batch, whether it is required on a timely basis every week, every day at a certain time. So that their infrastructure has to be there. The what analysis tools are required uh, even your ML code may be made up of, at times when you solve the problem, your complete model might not be written in the same programming language. So let's say I'm trying to solve a problem. There's a high chance that I might do a few things with R and for a few things I might use Python and a few things I might be using maybe, maybe some other language like Scala or Java or anything. Now this mix and match of languages uh, work good for the modeling phase. The code could also be not uh, good for deployment. It could be dirty because I'm experimenting and experimental code should not go as easy in production. But let's say you refine everything. Still, you need to have uh, a set of tools around this code to regularly monitor it. Monitor if there is junk in the code, if there is an unused part of the code. If you have an attribute in the code, which you are not using, it went with the data, it stayed there, it is affecting, let's say, it is bringing in multicollinearity and simply not move it. So there has to be a detailed monitoring of everything before it goes into production. And then a complete setup of how will it be utilized in production, including the, uh, let's say, process management tools, feature extraction process, everything has to be defined. This complete infrastructure needs to be set up and there are various things which could go for a task if anything is missed. So there has to be a, a monitoring of the code itself that how is it behaving in the setup. If there is any changes observed, then what? Uh, how do you ensure that the model does not deviate from the metrics claimed? So these are the things which you have to be cognizant about and you have to explain even the, to the team, let's say the administrator or maybe the person uh, let's say DevOps admin or your software engineering team who is also helping you with the deployment, they might not be aware of these things about your machine learning algorithms. So you need to explain them that these are the things I'll be needing. This is the infrastructure. These things can go for a toss. This is my code. If you have enough time after building the model, someone can put that code in a more robust language like C++ or Java, wherein it is less prone to errors. It should not be of the experimental form the way it was in R or Python. It should be more uh, 
in the form the way software programs are coded. So now you have the model and you know you can use something like a predictive markup language for a calling the model itself. But the entire piece of code is very little about the calling the model. That's the black part in between. It is about a lot of other things, various configurations, data collection, verification, feature transformation. Uh, so we, uh, maybe if it's a big data thing, so you have to manage uh, the resource management has to be there. Uh, so there are uh, even human resource as well as machines. So there are a number of things here in picture, which one should be cognizant about when going to deploy it. Because if any of them does not or creates an error, it will affect the prediction of, or let's say pattern recognition power of your model. So these things have to be uh, cared about. And we'll see what are some of the practices in the industry to take care of these things. And uh, let's say, we'll also look at what problems if any of you have faced. So if you look at the challenges in ML model deployment, you will realize that size of the data is one challenge. And sometimes we build models on, uh, let's say on a data set, which is not of that huge size. And the model is also good, but I need to cater to dot of transactions in real time. So a good example would be, let's say you developed a model to identify a fraudulent transactions. Now you have taken past two years of transaction data and maybe the data was although very big, but maybe you could handle it on a standalone machine and you built a very good model. But when it comes to predictions of this model, there's uh, for any, even a small bank, there are transactions in millions happening every second. And maybe you, you have a few picoseconds to or microseconds to take that decision of whether it's fraudulent or not. So you need a different type of infrastructure for deployment, wherein you can take decisions in near real time. And you need a number of machines working on the same model or predicting from the same model which you have deployed. So data size is often not kept in mind when we are building the model, but it sh we should be cognizant about that how will this model be utilized and maybe preferred way could be that you could have built that model straight away on a distributed computing platform uh, instead of building it on a standalone system because that's how it is supposed to be used. Apart from that, quality of data needs to be taken care of. So if even if you have big data loads and huge data sets, but the data quality is not maintained, then the models uh, or its results won't be good. So there has to be a way to ensure that the data is of high quality to whatever you are treating as a data and on which models are built, the data is at least correct. Uh, if there is noise, you can you have some ways to deal with it, but if the data is completely incorrect or wrong, then the decisions will be wrong. Uh, then there are issues with locations. Your data sets might be located at various places. So nowadays, if you're working in a multinational organization, you might be creating a model which may require some data which is located either geography lo geographically located at a different place, or maybe it is there in various types of systems. Some data may be stored in relational databases. Some may be on cloud. And there are various security and compliance issues also for bringing these data sets together and then building models on top of it. So there are various things one has to uh, always consider while building models. So I have built a model. I should also think about how it will be utilized. What are the various constraints which might come up and have I thought about them? And have I do I have a plan so that it goes maybe for security compliance, location, data set tracking, all these should be thought about. The second important point is experimentation. So uh, as we all agree that uh, when we trying to research or build a model, we are doing experimentations. So the regular software, uh, let's say your Jupyter notebook, uh, it will support experimentation and research, but it is not meant for production or maybe your uh, R studio, this is, it provides a very good support for experimentation, but uh, putting a R code in production, you'll certainly have to change that code. That's not the, uh, because it could lead to more bugs and errors. So you have to ensure that you have a platform where you can research, experiment, as well as deploy. And as an industry, we all are not very ready for the same because data science itself is in a very nascent stage. And, uh, there are a handful of people who understand 
what needs to be done and where all errors could come up and most of us assume that any data science model is like a software package which could be used so you as a data scientist would be responsible for ensuring that everyone who is utilizing it understands the pros and cons understand various things which could crop up because that will affect the uh, let's say overall success of your model apart from that we do not have very good tools to track experiments for the same data set we build multiple models and there are uh, and we take something which is uh, giving us a good result later on we might realize that something which was giving us good results uh, for that i did a mistake so do i have to go back and look at all the code or maybe there should be efficient softwares and there are some in the market which could be used in production where i have a track of all previous versions i have tried so if i have to throw this one because there was some error uh, it's not that all my previous models are useless which i created so and then there should be a let's say a effort from your end or from the team side to ensure the quality of code when it goes from experiments to production and then model training time and troubleshooting of the model should be one should be cognizant about it uh, accuracy evaluation retraining i believe and infrastructure requirements especially in case of big data so some of the points you might already be aware of but they become very very important when it in terms of model deployment again how is your model being used whether it is used for online predictions or whether you are making i mean near real time predictions or real time predictions or whether you are using it for offline predictions which is like in batch you are using it once a month or maybe you have to use it once in a lifetime then are there strategies in the code which will tell you or which will warn you about the degradation of the model that uh, the model is no longer effective and you need to update it so have you built such things in the system so this these are the points one should be uh, cognizant of and one should ensure that they go as a part of the model because the model itself might be very good but it will not add to the revenues until all these points are covered uh, there are some other challenges which are uh, more specific to machine learning and maybe uh, you will understand it better than your software engineering team or the admin team which is supporting you so i want to highlight those points one of the problem is this hidden feedback loops so what happens is you create a model that model gives certain predictions based on the predictions company takes certain uh, actions and based on those actions maybe if they are affecting the data itself then you get the same kind of data for the next cut so it's like a uh, so uh, a more easier to understand example would be let's say we we read uh, google news uh, on a daily basis so the kind of news we read google keeps a track of it and then the next time when we are there it will show us those news or recommend those on stories but what will happen at the end is that i'll keep on getting the same thing which i do not want maybe i want some new news also but i'm not getting from that application and that is the feedback loop which is taking in uh, which is uh, which is often hidden even from the data science uh, data scientist point of view because he is not cognizant about how are the results being used or the uh, actions taken after the results in some way affecting my data itself so when it comes to optimization uh, or improving any model there are often two strategies one is about ex experimenting or trying out new things and the other is about taking uh, advantage of what we already know so you might have uh, heard something about like this in uh, when you are trying to understand reinforcement learning if some of you know that so what we do is part of reinforcement learning this small fraction of the total work goes on experimenting into new things while the other fraction goes on doing what you already know is the best so same goes for machine learning models if you get into this hidden feedback loop you will not experiment on new things what you will do is you will always keep going what you think is the best you will also keep getting very good accuracies but that will essentially not lead to added revenues for the company because the ultimate goal is not to have those numbers but the ultimate goal is to add value for the company so it is very important that we understand how it is being used and what are the ways 
in which uh, it could get affected are we only utilizing the best things which we have learned from the model and prohibiting the model from learning new things which might be less beneficial but in the longer run may lead to more revenues for the company uh, did you get this point this is a very very important point apart from that you have a uh, pipeline so you have messy codes and which you can take care of uh, by refining the entire uh, model after it is built so you have finalized the model but before it goes in production you rewrite the code in a way so that it is more suitable for production inconsistency in data dependency and on, on any unused features you should take out so you have to take care of these things and also no matter you might have written the or done the experiments in multiple programming language but finally you should prefer the language which is more suitable for production environment and put it all in one language so that uh, software related bugs do not come up you also have to be cognizant of, uh, about the compute power which might be required do you need a high end cpu do you need gpus uh, how many do you need or can the load increase are you using the model in real time when is there a possibility that let's say your model is used on a website and most people visit this website only between 8 and 9 am in the morning and rest of the day it is empty so are you managing the data load properly so these are the things also where which will adversely affect the model so you have to be cognizant about it are the models portable am i building a model which is serving some legacy system but when the company decides to change the entire system let's say go on big data my model soon to work anymore uh, what is about scalability some day if i have to do a more scalable deployment will my model still be supported there or do i have to build everything from scratch so there are a number of things which one has to be cognizant about and maybe ask your uh, let's say directors or maybe the decision makers in the company uh, before you start working on it so that the effort is fruitful for the company also they might not know about it so they may not consider it but you should be aware of it there are a number of revolutions prevalent in industry i also saw a chat related to ml ops so ml ops is nothing but devops for machine learning so whatever devops principles and practices we have in place uh, and some of the machine learning specifics the specifics which i talked about so there are various uh, ml ops practices followed by some company but there is not a fixed standard the reason is everyone has slightly different requirements so different industry depending on the kind of data models they are using are following slightly different standards is devops for machine learning is not as uh, generalized as your uh, software engineering devops as of now but it is growing and it is being acquired and because we are aware of the various challenges so we understand that there is a need of a basic devops process for machine learning needs also and there have been a number of softwares also which support to an extent the devops for machine learning which are used by administrators uh, in many companies uh, even in mine but the important thing is that you have to ensure that the admin or the engineering team or the other stakeholders are aware of those assumptions which are going in the model and which could affect the overall picture so instead of uh, wanting the users of your model to understand all the details of the model what you should do is you should try and understand at a high level the engineering the uh, let's say networking all the on the model utilization on the business use case you should go and go ahead and take that effort because that will simplify the life understanding what is going in the algorithm is tough and you went through a six months course but the other related things uh, knowing them that what is their use and uh, what can be their pros and cons is not very tough so it's always good to know these things which are surrounding your ml model at a high level so that you can guide them properly you will not become a ml ops or you will not become a certified engineer but you will guide your engineering team in the right way so that they end up taking the right decisions related to your model i hope this point is clear and that this is one of the ways in which I mean, the way i started was that there is a technical debt of machine learning models or machine learning deployment so this is one way of paying off the technical debt so we should know 
precisely how the new model or how we update on this model would affect the entire system. Uh, we should not assume that uh, people are aware that that's how machine learning works, and therefore they should be uh, they should be cognizant of it uh, because most of us are the users of uh, data science or machine learning algorithms. They are not the ones who are doing it, and therefore they do not know the intricacies. Okay. Uh, there's a question: Isn't it hard to implement a Python R prototype to Java C++ production? Are the Java C++ library okay? Great question. So Sridham has a question. Uh, the question is, is it hard to implement Python R prototype to Java C++ for production? So no, Sridham, it is not hard. Why? Because you do not have to build the model again. So as I mentioned in the beginning of the lecture, let's say I have a prediction model. Its job is to do some regression or classification. I have this uh, print. PMML, which is called predictive markup modeling, a predictive modeling markup language. It's very similar to the markup languages for software development. So, PMML itself is language agnostic. It's the language which do not notes down the details of your model. That is the main function which is taking decisions. So, let's say I build a model in R or Python, and I save the model, I export it in the form of PMML, then I can call it in a Java program and use that model. Because as I said, the ML part of code, the ML code part is a very small part of the entire infrastructure or array of things which need to work around the main deployment. So first of all, you do not have to build the entire model from scratch. You have built a model. What, what does model building means? That means that from the past data, you have understood the function which is working on this data. Model building is all about finding that fx, if you remember your classes. It is all about finding that function which defines how data behaves if I want to get something or want to predict something or maybe understand the pattern. So finding that function is the machine learning process. So if you have found that function, you can also most of the times check that function. So let's say if I looked at the data and I found a function, I used the linear regression algorithm and my function was something like the 3.5 times the first attribute plus 3.2 times the next attribute plus 2.8 times the third attribute plus some constant. And that is giving me something which I want to do, some y value. So this is my fx, the function I have found. Once I know the function, I can save the function and that's called saving the model. Once you have saved the model, the model is the model's saved part is nothing but pure maths, which any programming language can use because the PMML or uh, any of the markup languages they are language agnostic. So you save it and then, uh, yes, PMML may not support some of the algos, but the model. So, again, uh, I'm talking about saving the model itself, so it's not about uh, building a model. Who in it, so but once I have saved the model, it is agnostic of what approaches or what algorithms did I use to build that model. Charity, you had a point that PMML does not support block language. Do you understand? So it is uh, what if you're thinking that PMML will be used to build or you you'll use an algorithm on it. No, it's not the case. You build a model in R, you can save it, save the model on the drive. Now, when you save it, if you want to use it in Python, you can use PMML. Uh, recently, came over deploying notebooks. Are they scalable? Can everyone else also read the chat, or uh, should I repeat these questions? Uh, maybe not everyone. So this is a question you can read. Oh, great. So uh, deploying Jupyter notebooks are they scalable? When should we not use them for deployment? So Jupyter notebooks are not scalable, and although they claim so, but they are not. They are they are notebooks, so they are for data sharing and experimentation. Uh, better thing is maybe even if you are doing it in Spider for Python, it is not better than using Jupyter notebooks for production. We can okay. So again. Uh, Let's say you use a Jupyter notebook on Spark. That notebook is not the same Jupyter notebook which you are using. Okay, it is supported from Jupyter, but the same codes as it is won't work there. 
So uh, maybe Microsoft uses a Jupyter notebook and they have their own uh, Microsoft Jupyter notebook kind of attack to it, which is slightly different and works for those algorithms. So there are differences. I'm talking about the strictly local Jupyter notebooks. So they are more about experimentation. Once you have the code there, you can save it in a either .py file or you can build your code itself in Spider. When you're doing a production level coding, the Spider is a better tool. Jupyter is easier. So it helps us, uh, even Spider is that easy. It's about practice. But Jupyter helps us do the sharing. Any notepad or any notebook, the advantage is it is lightweight and it can help us share the code with other team members easily. So that is the advantage it comes with and you can have your experiments and throw away the part of the code or delete lines in between with ease. But when it comes to deployment, you can simply uh, download the entire Jupyter notebook into a .py file and then deploy that, which will be error-free. So Akashic, when you talk about you can deploy, yes, you can. But the best way is that there is an option in Jupyter notebook wherein you can download the notebook into a .py format. So that will, uh, let's say if you're using other languages, if your main system, let's say my main system is built on C++ and machine learning models helping me do a prediction, which is a small part of the main system. Okay, And that system may not support a lot of things. It definitely supports Python. Most of the systems do have support for it. Uh, but maybe with Jupyter Notebook, you might face issues in production. So you download it as a .py file and then use it with the uh, other codes. Again, and the entire industry of open source tools, it is evolving. So new things come up, you have some updates, some fixes here and there. All uh, the intent of this lecture is to be cognizant about what all issues can crop up and are we making the other stakeholders aware of it and are we ourselves cognizant about it? And have we taken the desired steps to ensure that we can mitigate these issues? This was the intent of the session. And this is what I want you to take home. Uh, no uh, quick answers because the best way to find the quick answers is Google. So, because it will give you the most updated answer. Even I won't give you that updated answer. But you can Google on, okay, should I be doing this? But the intent here is you should be cognizant about that these are the things you should be careful about or they could lead to issues in deployment. That's the main purpose. Any other question if I skip? What's the scope of Python language in data science in terms of versatility, deployment, etc.? So we do as a question, scope of Python language in data science in terms of versatility, deployment, etc. So Python is a, a one of the most used languages in data science as of now, and it has a huge scope. But uh, you also uh, should be aware that Python, uh, and again, I'm saying this for standalone machines. I'm not saying it for distributed computing, where Python is supported, but in deployment, not too much preferred, not preferred at, in fact. So, uh, let's talk about the standalone machines. We are not talking about distributed computing or Spark and Hadoop systems. So for standalone machines, Python is used a lot. Python is a very good language, uh, very easy to learn. But we have to understand that the part of the Python, which is really very, very easy, does not actually contribute to the effectiveness of the Python. Python takes packages from various uh, robust languages like C++ and Java, and it uses uh, those packages to optimize the overall code. So uh, to make it very efficient, the runtime should be efficient. So Python is easy to use, but comes with a, a more memory usage, comes with uh, being very slow. And therefore you have these packages like NumPy and Pandas and Matplotlib. None of them are itself in Python. So uh, when it comes to deployment, as long as you have supported packages and Python has a lot of supported packages in nearly all the languages. So it is very, very good. When it comes to distributed computing, I will say it's still Python is not that good. And you have to, I mean, uh, languages like Scala are more preferable if you have uh, a need where you have to take a real time decision. Okay, so I have a question here. How do we monitor model drift 
data drift and also how multicollinearity in production okay three points i'll start with the last one multicollinearity in production so multicollinearity will not be there in production unless and until i left it unobserved during my model development phase so if i can detect it it will not be part of the model so it cannot crop up suddenly unless and until there is a change so let's go to the next point uh, drift in the model so you you may have parameters to monitor the performance of the model and when you see that the model performance has dipped by a certain percentage let's say you you are in a process where it is okay to have a let's say a drift of 10% you have built something at 80% uh, accuracy and you are getting 70% and you are okay with it or maybe if you your sister or your business needs it that so what should be that threshold 5% 10% but there should be a threshold wherein alerts are generated in the uh, deployed system these alerts will let you know that you have crossed that threshold and your model is underperforming then you need to dig deep to see what is the reason for its underperformance and if it's just a fluke because you know that your models are built on these um, let's say 95% confidence so 5% of times it could happen which is not a major case but if we if there is a reason for it uh, you dig deep into the code and see if there is a reason if it is consistent then it's time that you need to update the model that means that it's it's a very good time to update the model when it comes to data drift or drift in data itself that happens when there is a change in the business so let's say the business was capturing a data point but now the business has decided not to capture that data point and capture some other data point if you understand because the the way uh, business was operating it thought that this particular data point was important and it captured in the data but now that has changed so if there is a drift in the way business used to consider data or maybe the business has added another data point which might be very useful but your model is not using it so you have to uh, again uh, retrain the model with that data point or that attribute right so that that's a drift in the data itself wherein the business has updated the data it is planning to save or whether changed something or added something or removed something each of them is a drift and could happen so let's say Uh, your bank they might be uh, storing various details about the customers uh, from past 20 years but they used to store our addresses but not our mobile numbers we never used to carry mobiles at that time but nowadays it is mandatory that the banks will store the mobile numbers for the customer and otp is very very important so that's a drift in the way banks store the data or storage of email id the earlier maybe there were no fields um, in the databases where they used to store the email id they never asked for it from the customer but nowadays it is important so that kind of drift happen when things change so uh, that drift if it is evident in the data and the model is built on the older data where it was not present then you have to update the model to the new data how do we validate our data generally uh, i could not get this question arpana yes very right akshay you wrote the right things 85% of use case don't get productionized due to lack of proper end to end structural pipelines okay so um the question is very good but that's what we all are trying to do so we know they do not get productionized uh, we know that we do not have a solution because the industry is in a nascent stage so it is not that we have been doing data science for several decades so business has recently started using data science and its capabilities so it will take time at the moment what we can do is we should be cognizant about the problems which could come and as i talked about in the presentations come up with ways to mitigate or minimize those challenges i hope i answer your questions um 
pretty much all of it you have gone through uh, uh, avinash thanks and i think we have one i believe you've missed from partha who's been asking you what kind of tools you use uh, for deployment at capgem or okay. any of the organization previously that you were associated with what tools are you using the organization for deployments so uh, thank you for mentioning that so partha it depends on the requirement so uh, I should not be talking uh, details about the organization I'm working, but usually all big organizations when they uh, when the model is complete, there is an engineering team which works on ensuring that the model is good for deployment. So, uh, as I say that the data scientists create dirty codes, but the software engineers will ensure that the coding is as per the requirement. At times, a if required, the model could be, the steps could be repeated in a different language. So someone also asked if libraries are available in Java or C++. So yes, machine learning libraries are available. They are uh, not that easy the way we do it in Python or R. The simple reason being why they are not so easy to use is because Java itself is a tough language, but there are a lot of libraries. All the machine learning libraries are available for Java. They're open source, so you do not have to pay for it. And they work very well. So when you take the code in production, at times you might want to uh, repeat those steps, make a robust framework around it. And uh, let's say Java, or if speed is very, very important, then maybe C++. But once you have made this framework, that's for standard machines. At times, if you are using distributed computing, then there could be other factors involved. And mostly for a service company like Capgemini, it is driven from the client. So once your model is ready, uh, it has to be deployed. If you are doing it for a client, then it has to be deployed the client side. So it is driven by the client because their systems might be following a particular uh, language or they have a certain kind of infrastructure. So what is more suitable? So there is a technical team which assesses what is the right way to deploy this model. And it could vary from client to client or depending on the requirement. So there's no set strategy for deployment, yes, but uh, the preference is always for more robust languages. Uh, experimental languages, statistical languages are better for experimenting and creating models. Uh, for uh, you, So uh, I can tell about a, a project we did for one of the leading banks in India for fraud analytics. And there we built most of the models, uh, we experimented and we did it in uh, PySpa. But, uh, and that was identifying fraud. So, but when the model was to be deployed, they wanted it to be deployed in Scala. And that was important because of speed. And apart from that, they had uh, some of the uh, systems which could not go with all the open. So they wanted, uh, let's say, partially branding the open source part so that there is someone who can, uh, they can lean upon if there is an issue. So productionizing a model is like another many, many hours of work. When you have built a model, if it's a complex system like fraud identification, when you have built a model, you might take a few months, three, four, six months to build a model. But putting it into production might take another two, three years because there has to be a, a complete thought process around it that what all could go wrong and before you put it into use. And also it depends where you want to use it, how important it is. So uh, for fraud identification versus the recommendation in it, there are very, very different things. Fraud identification, I, it is of utmost importance. Whereas a recommendation engine, it is also very important for a company like Amazon and all. But if real time recommendations may have an issue at a time, I will not completely lose the business. It's just that I'm not able to recommend the customers right. So depends on the requirement and how much time uh, does the business think is ad adequate for it. And then deployment strategies are formulated. So, Partha, uh, I, I hope you understand that this is not a generic thing. So, I mean, I, I've given you a generic answer because there's no a one answer for uh, uh, this generic question. It depends on a lot of things. So, if you give me an example, I can suggest some deployment strategies for that. And also, I'm not from a deployment team. I'm just aware of it. Uh, I do modeling the way you guys do.
Okay, in case a different data happened, you need to validate the data file in data preparation. Okay, so Arpana, if a drift in data happens, it won't. So a data drift, like a company deciding to save more data attributes for uh, for their customers, it doesn't happen. Uh, let's say in night, it doesn't happen overnight. It is a long process. So when I talked about data drift, what I'm saying is, let's say you built a model. And your model is dependent on a few attributes and based on which it is making some prediction. And those attributes are refined. So the model won't work. Now, uh, if the business, if that attribute is important and your model is using that attribute and the, there, is a, there is a reason why the business will not have that attribute anymore, you'll have to retrain the model. So compared to us, uh, the example which I wanted to bring out is you have to be cognizant about what all you are using in the model. And if one of them, let's say the value is NA or it goes blank because the database doesn't have a value. In that case, the model could lead to error. So you have to, uh, once you build a model, you have to understand the function it has found and what attributes is it using, what checks each of the attribute has to go through before passing it to the model. So there is a lot of uh, infrastructure requirement around the ML code, which is required. That was the point I wanted to bring you. Spark versus Dask. Okay, so see again, uh, it would be better if you do this search on Google uh, because these are the questions which will have very correct answers on Google. And uh, if I have to make a choice, make a decision for a client, which to should he or uh, should a company prefer? Then I will also see what is the most updated thing in the market for my requirement. So let's say if I have to build a model uh, and I have a choice to make whether I use Python or not. So depending on which, uh, and I can use both, let's say I'm comfortable with both languages, then which language uh, or which uh, uh, algorithm is, let's say, better implemented in a particular library will be my choice. So maybe I can say, okay, some visualizations I find are better than Python. Some statistical algorithms, let's say forecasting time series, they're well implemented in R versus Python. Something, let's say engineering part, Python is doing better. This is based on my experience. But tomorrow, there is a chance that Python could update few visualization libraries. Python could also update their, uh, let's say, forecasting models. And they have a better uh, model and even better working in R. So it is always good. Whenever there is a requirement, you Google, you see who has used it. And if it has been good for quite some time, then that's what you should recommend for production. Not something which is very, very new. Uh, amongst the Spark and Desk, I can say that Spark is a more reliable tool. But again, that is just my uh, way of thinking and it could be biased. But yes, it has been old in the market and we have more trust on Spark. Okay, in NLP area, I find it really difficult to select my tech stack. NLP, uh, which language are you trying to do NLP from? Is it R, Python, Java, which one? Because the best stack is available on, uh, best stack is available in Java. And uh, that's Stanford Core NLP. That's the best thing. Although Python has recently got support for Stanford Core NLP. But there are some uh, some bugs in the new version. But uh, the best NLP libraries are available in Java. One of them is if you visit the site of Stanford. So the best one is the Stanford NLP, Stanford Core NLP, which will take care of most of the NLP needs, and they are by far better than most of the NLP libraries. Means better as in ten to fifteen percent better. Uh, uh, Avinash, there is, I think, just one uh, final question uh, that's uh, been asked by Kaushik and uh, Ramna Kumari. Uh, as a fresher uh, looking for data science uh, positions, 
how do we work on production based uh, you know deployment practical use cases would you be able to help out or you know uh, suggest anything for them okay so as a fresh graduate first thing uh, i believe that you would be looking for jobs in data science as a data scientist and you would not be deploying the models because that requires a slightly different skills that require administrating skills that requires knowledge of networking that requires a few other details which is not part of this institute program uh, this entire session is oriented around not you deploying the model it is oriented around you being aware of what could go wrong in a model deployment phase and you can guide the engineering team or the admin team or other teams about these issues which can come up and tell them that this is what i'm using give them the details yourself know the details of the model you are using so it should not be that you are using a regression and you do not know which attributes this regression is using you should not use even simpler models like black boxes if you know what you are using what should be the input what transformations are you using so let's say you are using three variables x1 x2 x3 x2 you are taking a log transform now you have to ensure that x2 doesn't have a negative value right because you cannot take log of a negative number so if by any chance it comes in the data so during the during model building you know negative values are not there and you did the transform and you got a very good model but when you are deploying this model the code has to do a check for x2 that okay this is should be the range it could be between let's say 20 and 50 it cannot be below 20 and more than 50 so you have to write that kind of code which does the check when it, it takes data as an input so that it does not throw up a error Uh, does it make sense? So those are the things which uh, either you or the person who is working as an engineer to make this code as a production, they should incorporate. In fact, you should you can do it on your own if you are good engineers too. Then you have to make the administrators and uh, the networking team aware of the assumptions of the model. Uh, assumptions in this key, what attributes, what input it is using, where can it go wrong, what transforms are you making, so where can it go wrong. do not hope that they will know that you are taking a log transform so a negative number will be taken from they will not know that there is something which you should be aware of i hope you understood my point so every little detail about the model which you build if you are aware of it and you inform the engineering or the uh, let's say administrator uh, who is there to deploy the model then uh, and if you have taken care of it in your code also so coding part if you can take care of it or if you have a uh, team where uh, engineers are uh, let's say refine your model again and they will take care of it but you need to tell them that's that's first thing and second thing what all could go wrong and what to do if something goes wrong so if these things are advised in design they should go the complete software application design should go in the fixed model where ml model is a small part but it is a complex part and number of things could go wrong and many people who are working around the ml model deployment they themselves do not know how this machine learning model is working so you are the ones who are creating this model you should be aware of it and you should let them know what all could happen so that is the most important insight here great um uh, avinash uh, we have more questions coming in but uh, seem we are kind of out of time so would it be uh, possible for you to uh, respond on linkedin if they reach out to you directly would you be okay yes. with that yes i'll be okay with it yeah so uh, for the purpose of our time uh, slot guys i uh, request everybody if you have more questions please reach out to avinash uh, directly on linkedin and um, i think that should be it avinash we can uh, go ahead and wrap up Uh, the session thank you so much for patiently answering all the questions and uh, for the information you have shared so far uh yeah i mean i think that's pretty much it from my side so if you have any additional uh you know information to share please go ahead um apart from that that's it have a good weekend everybody thank you sir thank you guys i do not have any additional info to say to uh, share uh, what i will do is i'll share the presentation with sumira who, who may sh in turn share it with you and feel free to reach me on linkedin or wherever to connect with me and if you have some questions uh, feel free to reach me i'll answer you uh, means whenever i see the question or whenever i am available but ask questions and uh, 
be open to learning things which even which you are not using here at Ensotec. So you are learning certain number of things uh, uh, related to machine learning. Uh, the entire process you have learned, but there are various things around machine learning which uh, which are the defining steps for the success of your machine learning model. So you should know about those things. You should know about the engineering DevOps part, not learn DevOps or engineering as a career, but you should know at a high level what is happening at those steps and what things in my ML model will affect it so that you can at least make the, uh, make the other stakeholders aware of the uh, various details about your model and help them understand where all a trap could come or error may occur. Okay, and that should be enough. Right? 